As you can see, we only make one type. Yeah. <laughs> Blonde hair, blue eyes. Um, uh -huh. Our first trip, my first trip here to South Africa, um, Kate was actually pregnant with Keturah. She was at home. And some of our greatest memories as a family, um, as we've traveled across the world, have been when we've come here. Mm -hmm. Just because your culture is so accommodating to, to kids, and you, you, it's just such a family atmosphere, which nothing against Europe, but... <laughs> It's a little different up there and, and other places. And so anyway, may introduce him. This is Keturah. She's 11. This is Malachi. He's nine. This is Ezra. He's seven. And Zion the lion is four. I'm four. <laughs> so tomorrow we're going to celebrate 4th of July together as a family here in South Africa, American Independence Day. And... We just love your nation. So thank you for welcoming us. Kate, you want to say yeah, something? Yeah, we're just so happy to be here. And we get to be here this week for worship school. And we're so excited for anybody who's going to come join us. We just can't wait to have conversation and see what God's doing in South Africa. We're going to make Kate preach. Yeah. And, and Katur is going to share a little bit, too. So yeah. it'll, be, it'll be really fun. Thank you, guys. God bless. Um, I want to share a quick uh, video Last night was our, um, our first night after two overnight flights. It was our first night trying to acclimate. So a little rough, but we'll get there <laughs> sleeping. Um, but I want to show you this quickly before I share. Uh, this is a, a preview for a trailer um, of a film on Let Us Worship, a documentary film that is actually going to be shown in 500 theaters across America starting, I think, two or three weeks from today. So this will give you a little quick background on the movement, what God's done. It's also a little spicy, too, which is good. Go for it. Breaking news, stay at home. That is the order tonight as the coronavirus pandemic spreads. We need to bend the curve in the state of California. Social distancing works. Stay home save lives. Your actions can affect my health. It's critically important that everyone follows the orders that we are given. The governor of California came out with a new set of restrictions. One of those restrictions was you can no longer sing in church anymore. Period. Full stop. And I remember when he said that and I heard that, I was like, <laughs> okay, it's on. <laughs> More than 50,000 Americans have now died from this virus. Christian singer and activist Sean Foyt leading what's called Let Us Worship. He called it a worship protest. Oh, the organizers used the pretense of religion, and that simply was not right. If Jesus were here right now, he absolutely would wear a mask. Meanwhile, suicide rates are exploding. Drug and alcohol use is ravaging America, rioting and, and destruction and unrest, and there's no church to bring the hope. I get a letter from the city prosecutor saying that you're violating the CDC requirement. We reserve the right to arrest your church members. Every thought I had was I wanted to end it. That's scary. If you've observed recurring violations of the safer at home order, in this case, snitches get rewards. It's wild that this is happening in America, and it's wild that people are okay with it. There was a, a man that we met. He grew up in the communist country. He grabbed my hands and he said, all the things that are happening right now is how it began for us. America needs to wake up. You have to wake them up. Now that is where communism and Christianity have a headlong clash. How close is Christian nationalism to white nationalism? It is close. There are things happening today that are pushing people to a second American revolution. Christians are rising up, I'm telling you guys. This guy is probably responsible for hundreds of deaths. You know how valuable your life is? Jesus, we have to do here, this country. What people like Sean are saying about what God says, oftentimes is false. You are not a Christian! There's a pandemic, there's a plague, here's a move of God that's going to change America. So, uh, what's amazing about this story and what God's doing is um, it is bit obviously been controversial. If you would have told me worship 
in 2022 in America would be controversial, I would have said, you're lying. But it was. And um, the Lord used the controversy and is still using it. And so our hope is, um, because the way that we, we, we created this, or this documentary was told was really both sides, right? So we have, we have people on there sharing uh, what they don't like, people sharing. We have fans. We have trolls, basically. And the amazing thing through it all is we're going to get the attention of a lot of people that wouldn't normally come to church, a lot of people that wouldn't normally see a cheesy Christian film, because that's not what this is. Uh, this might even be, uh, it's going to be rated either PG-13 or R, simply because the protesters love to use the F-bomb. <laughs> so, and we have a lot of footage of them in there. But at the end of the film, in each of these 500 theaters, we're going to have an evangelist placed that's going to stand up and give an altar call. The first time we shared this film, we were pitching it to investors uh, to try to get some marketing capital. An atheist film producer showed up. At the end of the film, he's breaking down sobbing. He says, I want to give my life to Jesus. That's the first time it was ever screened. And so I believe God's going to use this as a massive evangelism tool. And um, I don't know when, it, when or how it's going to make its way over to South Africa, but I really hope it does. And you guys can be praying for us um, as we continue the journey. Um, I, I am so excited to be here. As, as uh, John had mentioned before, um, you know, the last international trip I took before the pandemic was, was here. And I don't know how many of you guys were there at the conference. Sean Bowles was there, Bill Johnson. And I remember a moment I was backstage and, you know, the rumblings of this virus in China were starting to, you know, starting to spread across the world. And I, and I, I remember sitting in the back room and thinking, guys, what do you think about this? And Sean was like, ah, oh, you know, and I'm not like the, I don't claim to be a prophet or prophet, you know, I'm just, I just hear from God, I'm a worship leader, I'm a missionary, but something in my spirit, and I even told my wife this, this is going to change everything, and it's going to test our faith unlike anything this generation has seen, and I remember I woke up in my bed one night when I first heard about this, 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 uh, this thing in China, and I was like, I told my wife, I'm usually like optimistic, hopeful, oh, it's not going to be a big deal. I said, this is going to change everything. And um, little did I know that a few weeks after I would get home and everything was shut down, I had 30 international trips planned across the world. Those were all shut. Um, then I lost my, you know, congressional election that I was running for, and I felt like the whole world, like, I was just like, God, what am I doing with my life? Just really despair, you know, and I, I, I rarely get to those places, you know, I'm a very joyful, hopeful person, but I was just really bummed out, I was depressed, I'm like, God, what are we doing with our life, now everything's shut down, and it was in the midst of that crisis that God began to birth a movement in us, and um, I feel like this is a, f this is like, to me, God's bringing it around to this full picture because this is the first place now out of the entire world that we're bringing Let Us Worship movement to outside of America. And I think it's significant. Um, and, and I don't know how many guys have followed our journey, but, you know, we've, we've gone to over 170 cities around, around our nation, uh, averaging anywhere from, you know, 4,000 people attending to 40,000 people. This has been by far the largest movement of revival in America that I've seen in my lifetime. Like, I never imagined seeing the things that we would see um, in the last few years. And, you know, God decided to birth it in the middle of a pandemic. Who knew? Right? Right when all hell was breaking loose, when America's cities were being burned to the ground, when we had the most controversial election, when we had this, this battle over the theology of which Jesus are you following? You know, the one that hides in its room with a mask on watching a live stream or the one that brings healing and hope to the world, right? And so in the midst of all of this, God birthed something. It started on the uh, Golden Gate Bridge and, um, you know, I want to say this because I think it's important. Like, I didn't really give a rip about America, you know, I get accused now of being a white nationalist and all you care about is, and I'm like, y'all don't even know my story. 
Like, I grew up as a missions kid. My parents were medical missionaries, which, by the way, my whole family are doctors besides me. I, 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 didn't, I didn't quite make the cut, I guess. Uh, so I was very, very connected and in tune when the whole pandemic happened. And, you know, I, I knew from, from my family, you know, they, they felt like it was an engineered, I mean, engineered virus specifically uh, to bring catastrophe around the world. I mean, this is so demonic. Can I get an amen? Anybody think this is demonic? Anybody think the enemy was using fear to shut the church down? And so at some point along the way, you know, you got to like, and I feel like Christians, like it's time for us to like break out of the media fog and the narratives is what the world is say, okay, this is demonic. It's not hard to tell that. Two, this is a spirit of fear. Three, we're going to have nothing to do with it. And we're going to stand as the church in this season and be, being the hope of God to the earth, right? Doesn't mean we don't care. Doesn't mean we don't believe that people are getting sick. Doesn't mean we, we don't think it's real. But we know that in this hour, the world is looking for a people that will not be shaken. We must be those people. Amen. A, a point nine 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 eight nine percent survivable virus will not stop the spread of the gospel. Okay, I'm just giving you facts. We've been through a whole lot worse things in history. That's why when the governor of California said you can't sing in church, I'm like, bro, who do you think you are? Uh, we learned this with this song in school, you know, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, ooh, baby, let my people go. Huh. And I just remember thinking, this guy is out of his mind. Like, not only is this not constitutional, I mean, America was built on the freedom to worship. And by the way, I want to say this. People gave a lot, gave a lot of hell to the pastors and leaders that took a stand. But I want to tell you one thing. Those pastors in California, the guys that we roll with, the people like Cheon and others, they sued the governor and they won five times in the Supreme Court. Did you know because of their stand in America, never again in the history of America ever can the can the government of California tell the church to shut down for anything? Because of the boldness and courage of a few pastors, and they got a lot of flack for it. That's not really Christ-like. Jesus wouldn't really do that. Da-da-da-da-da. But guess what? They took a stand so that everybody else can enjoy this incredible freedom. Amen? But it, not only was it not constitutional, but it was not biblical. And so I was just thinking, man, I've spent so much time with the underground church the church in America has supported us to go break the law in other countries. <laughs> you guys here have supported us. We've gone from here to Iraq. We've gone from here to North Korea. We've gone from here to Afghanistan. We've brought Bibles and we've done church services. Guess what? It was all illegal. <laughs> Hello? And so now in our own nations, we're having to do something and break the law and do things that are illegal. Guess what? We're in good company. And it's like, what is our allegiance to, right? Is our allegiance to the word of God? Is our allegiance to 2,000 years of history of worshiping through plagues and pandemics and, 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 and all kind of horrible things? Or is our allegiance to try to make everyone feel safe and stay at home and don't, don't reach out to your neighbor even though they might be dying of isolation and depression and addiction. We had to discover as a church, do we believe in the songs that we sing? We got conferences. We got prophetic words. We got albums we listen to. We read books on this stuff. And then all of a sudden, the test comes to our own front door. How are we going to respond? Are we going to be the church of God that the gates of hell will not prevail against? Or are we going to be a people that just like the world, we cower in fear? So we had to all, you know, and for us as a family, it was, it was a crazy season because, you know, I, I had, and the Lord had us in California, man. He has a sense of humor. I'm like, God, I hate this state. 
And yet you had me in California and the Lord began to remind me of Azusa Street, the Jesus People Movement. He began to remind me of the history of revival. He began to, you know, I began to look through the life magazines in the 70s of hippies getting saved. I'm wondering, God, if you can do it again. I'm locked down in this horrible, desolate, God-forsaken land. But what is the reason, God, you have me situated for such a time as this? So we gather people on the Golden Gate Bridge, you know, I threw up a post on social media, didn't know if anyone was going to come. All of a sudden, in the midst of the most locked down city in America, 400 people show up. Now, you, you got to imagine, like, people weren't having church, but they weren't doing anything. This was a locked down city. And so the moment that somebody got their phone out and they put it on Facebook Live, we had 100,000 people watching. A church service on the Golden Gate Bridge. It was on Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, these crazy Christians. And, it, and, and you know, the thing is, is it was so raw, you know, because the phone's shaking and we're on the bridge and the, the wind and we have a little battery powered speaker system. I'm up there like going straight back to my missionary days, you know, worshiping, declaring, prophesying. And America was fascinated that there was a group of bold people willing to take a stand for Jesus. We began to worship on the bridge. We began to prophesy. We began to declare crazy things. And this is what we're going to do this week. I'm telling you, God is putting the paddles on South Africa, and it's time to get wild again. It's time to wake up. Break off, and I was feeling this in the first service. Break off the fog of the pandemic. Break off the isolation of the last season. Whatever weird habits, addictions, cycles that you got into, it's time to get free of them. Because the church of Jesus Christ is going back to wildness. We're going back to boldness. The post-COVID church looks different than the pre-COVID church. In America, you don't mess with the post-COVID church. We ain't playing games. We're coming there to kick the devil in the teeth. And you know what? We're on a win streak. The 50-year prayer we've been praying since 1973, God answered it on June 24th with the overturning of Roe v. Wade. That was like the weakest clap. Y'all don't understand. In 1973, the Constitution, there was an amendment made to protect the right to child sacrifice. Since that day, 63 million babies have been aborted. I've had open visions in worship before of the multitudes of children in heaven that never got a chance to live. We've been praying with tears. We've been crying out. We've been believing God. I have this life band on. It's been on my wrist for 10 years. This one, it's, it's pink. It used to be red. Never taken it off. Prayed every day that God would reverse the death decree. I had another one on. They were in my wedding pictures. My wife can tell you. I got so irritated, actually, with the first bracelet. After 10, 10, 10, day, 10 years, I cut it off. I cut off my first bracelet because everything was going the opposite direction. We weren't seeing righteous judges put in. It seemed all the abortion laws were getting worse and worse. And I said, God, why are we even praying for this? Why are we even praying for this? Like it's not happening. And I got frustrated and then I got convicted a year later and I put a new band on. The hilarity of God is that he waited till 2022 I don't think you guys could, I can overstate how wild this is, right? A left-leaning White House, a left-leaning Congress, a left-leaning everything. God's like, well, this is the time. Bam! I'm going to reverse the death decree. And, and the demons, the demons are freaking out. The demons and politicians and protesters, the demons and churches I mean, if I would have thought this is the most monumental day, you're talking about dividing lines. You're talking about polarization. We're, I mean, now we're trying to decide, are we going to stand on the side of child sacrifice? The hours we live in is crazy, you know? Like, there's no more gray area. And I feel like what God's doing in our nation is the same here. There's no gray area. There's no, like, chilling out, like, Coming to the Christian club, singing three fast, three slow, just blending in. No, no, no. 
It's time to get wild for Jesus. It's time to stand on the truth of his word. I'm telling you, this Saturday in Johannesburg, we are going to wreck hell with the songs and the sounds. We are going to give it, we're going to give it horns. <laughs> we're going all in. I mean, this is why we came here and we're excited. I want to read this quickly um, in Judges chapter 7 or 6 about Gideon because I just felt like it was, it was just, this is what we're here to do. Gideon... It's what I felt like when we were on the bridge. And by the way, we had 400 people that first day. We announced that day, hey, let's go down to Southern California where the Jesus People Movement thing started. Let's see what God wants to do. A thousand people show up. We start baptizing people in the Pacific Ocean. People start throwing their drugs and their antidepressants down in the sand and giving their life to Jesus. The next day we go to San Diego, 5,000 people in San Diego show up. The first and only time the LA Times had a good article about me. It, the front page of their article said revival in Orange County. Thousands of people flocking to the beach. I mean, guys, this is California. This doesn't happen in America. The hunger, the desperation created by the lockdowns and the isolation and the fear and the desire for people to want to meet Jesus was higher than ever before. In fact, Kate and I, we made the decision during that season. We never wanted to be these people, but it was just, we were forced to. We're like, I guess we're homeschool parents now. We took our kids out of school. We didn't want them to, one day they have to wear a mask. The next day they have to social distance. The next day we're like, no, no, no. We are going to create a narrative where our kids look back on this season and all they remember is revival. So we took them out of school. We took them on the road with us. I baptized Ezra, my seven-year-old, on that beach in San Diego with 5,000 people in the middle of revival. Fox News was there broadcasting the whole thing. And I baptized him. And he'll never forget that moment. In the midst of a pandemic, we had revival on the beach and he got baptized. God was marking my kids. They look back on that season. They don't remember fear. They remember, wow, dad, God moved everywhere across America. And Gideon, I love this. God shows up and he says, <laughs> the angel shows up. And he speaks to him and he says, the Lord's with you, mighty warrior. This is Gideon, Judges 6, verse 12. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Gideon says, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are his wonders, as ancients told us about? Did not God bring us up out of Egypt? You know, I'm like, God, why did I lose my congressional election? Why did I blow my life up? Why does nobody in the, in the worship world, all my cool friends want nothing to do with me now because I took a stand and now everything's locked down and I can't even escape to the nations. That's like my escape. Get the heck out of America. Now I'm stuck in commie California. What about the words what, that you said? I mean, this was my cry to the Lord and I love it how... God is so patient. The Lord didn't even respond to his cynicism. He just said, ah, go in the strength you have and save Israel. <laughs> Gideon like has this list of things. What about this and this and this? And God goes, eh, just go and save Israel. Shut up. Quit whining. I feel like in some ways we've partnered with the Spirit where we just, we just get in this. It's just this like entitlement, you know, it's all about me, 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 culture. I got to work through my issues and I just don't know Will I feel safe. I got to feel known again and all this kind of inward crap. And I feel like the Lord's saying, no, no, no. Nothing good is found while you look inward. Start looking upward. Start looking upward. I have a call and a mandate on your life. Are you ready to roll or not? And so Gideon, he reluctantly says, oh, you know, how can I say, then he responds, pardon me, Gideon says, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I'm the least of my family. The Lord says, ah, eh, I will be with you and you will strike down the Midianites. Isn't it amazing how God loves to use? I mean, I, I, I tell people all the time, like, 
I love that story, Reinhard Bonnke, you know, God, I'm out here with a million people in Nigeria about to preach the gospel. I can't believe that you chose me to do this. How did you choose me? And the Holy Spirit goes, I didn't choose you. You were 10th on my list. (laughs) I love hearing him share that story. He goes, huh? He said, you were 10th on my list. You were just the first one to say yes. I mean, literally, the things that we saw across America, they don't happen. 7,000 people in downtown Portland, right next to the longest standing riot in modern history. People worshiping God, getting set free, protesters running to the altar to get saved. 40,000 people in Washington, D.C., in the middle of a pandemic, making it the largest church service on earth in 2020. I mean, we're not the most capable. We're not the best worship leaders. We don't even know half that. We're just trying to follow God the best that we can, but we said yes. And when I gave God my yes, I said this in the first service, when I gave God my yes in high school, I didn't just give him my yes to things that aligned rightly with what I felt in my heart. I said yes for even the uncomfortable things. I mean, we've had more resistance come at us as a family, as a married couple than any time. Like, it's not even close. I mean, I've been in the darkest war zone, persecuted countries in the world. I've been in the, in the political arena, which is crazy. We had, we, we had no idea what we were getting into when we stepped into the middle of this pandemic and said, we got to come together to worship God. It was like the forces of hell were raging every day. Hit piece articles were written about us in all of the publications. Our words were being twisted. Our friends were deserting us. I mean, it's just on and on and on and on. But yet the greater the resistance, the greater the breakthrough. And so I love this story, you know, Gideon, it says, make the fleece wet, make it dry. I don't know. Are you still, you know, and it's like he, he has this journey with the Lord where, you know, God is so patient, like, Good thing we weren't God, you know. He would just smite. We would just smite these people. It's like Gideon is trying to barter with an angel, first of all. He's like talking to an angelic being. And he's like, I don't really know. I feel kind of weak. And then he asked God to run through the gauntlet, make it fleece wet, make the fleece dry. But anyways, God has this incredible patience. And then I love it how He goes forward and and the Lord says, Gideon, the sound is mightier than the sword. As you break the jars and you release the sound of the Lord, the camp of the enemy will be sent into chaos. There is a battle over worship in 2022 like we've never seen in our life. Why? Because the sound is mightier than the sword. Because when we lift up the sound and we lift up the cry and we lift up the roar of Jesus over our nations, over our cities, over our families, things happen. Think about it. What's the whole thing behind the mask? I mean, just the demonic agenda. It's to silence us. It's to domesticate us. It's to shut us down. It's to keep us disconnected. What's the heart of God that we would rally together, take off the mask, lift up a roar, lift up a shout? Come on, I'm not being political. I'm just saying, don't you see the plan of the enemy in the last season? Y'all with me? It was a plan to shut you up. Don't go to church. I mean, we were, it's funny, part of the hypocrisy that we just had to call out is it's like, are you kidding me? Like, you can go to strip clubs and casinos and bars and marijuana dispensaries because those are essential? But the moment you go to church, it's a super spreader. You want to know one of the greatest parts at the end of this film? You see tens of thousands of people in all these cities. And guess what? At the end, we had over a dozen mayors launch contact tracing programs against us. We had the police involved. We had the federal government involved. We had people trying to track down how many infections happened at our gatherings across America. And you know what? Today I got fined. 
thousands of dollars by over 20 cities across America for hosting these gatherings. And you know what? The end of the film says not one single COVID case was discovered. I mean, first of all, it's just kind of like science. We're outside, duh. <laughs> We're in LA the other day, and the, with these, these people are just, they're, people are crazy, okay? We're in LA, and I'm like, these poor kids, they were outside, they all have masks on. I'm like, we're outside! Take it off, please, for the love of God, let your child breathe. Anyway. But not only that, these places were hedges of protection, man. The presence of God is the most protective place you can be in. The presence of God is the most satisfying place you can be in. The presence of God is the most joy-filled place you can be in. I mean, come on. If there's ever a moment for us to gather together and worship the name of Jesus, we do it in the darkest hour. And so Gideon, I love it how he... It talks about how the Lord sent him down with a specific goal. Raise up the sound. Shatter the jar. Call forth my presence and you'll see a victory. And that's exactly what we're going to do this week. We are going old school like 2010. Dancing around with the joy circle and bodies on the floor. That's where we're going. We're going old school fire. We're done with this trying to be cool, trying to be relevant, trying to, I hope all the media comes and they write that we're crazy Christians. I'm going to be like, yeah, we are. That's us. We're the crazy Christians. Tell the whole world. One of the things that, um, that the Lord gave us a key um, to, to some of the darkest cities we went in was, was to be the most obnoxiously joyful Christians the world's ever seen. So in all of this rage to get angry, I mean, even, you know, uh, the Lord has, has given us an, an amazing property on Capitol Hill. I won't, I won't go into the specifics of it, but it's just a dream come true. And uh, we ended up signing papers on this place. It's a block from the Supreme Court and two blocks from the Capitol. And um, I really thought God was maybe wanting to send me to D.C. as a politician, but it, I, I got it wrong. He's wanting to send me there as a worshiper. So we've been already discipling senators. We've had opportunities to pray over Supreme Court justices. We've had opportunities to worship in the halls of Congress. I mean, here's the thing. Like, like I don't care what mountain you're talking about, if it's media and entertainment. I don't care if it's education. I don't care if it's politics. All the mountains belong to Jesus. And they will all be filled with worship. Nothing's going to stop that. And so anyway, the Lord told us, uh, I'm like, God, we have this place in D.C. It's, it's a dream. What are we supposed to do with it? And all I heard was joyful intercession. And so we started a plan of 30 days of prayer walking. Now, this was before the leak of the Supreme Court case came out and America started to rage. This was before that. The Lord told us to march around the Supreme Court for 30 days with joyful intercession. As everybody is angry and ah, we're going to be the ones that are just walking with our guitars, singing. And so for 30 days, we, begin, we extended it to 40 days. And I think on the 41st or 42nd day, the Roe v. Wade verdict came down. Monday, the last place that I was at was Washington, D.C. before I came here. Monday, I was on the steps of the Supreme Court. And I said, you know what? We are going to party like it's 1999. We are going to worship. We are going to celebrate the goodness of God. And we did just that. It was an incredible time. So I'm taking the celebratory spirit and the wind streak here to South Africa. If God can do it in my nation, he can do it here. Y'all don't understand. I was told my whole life this was impossible. But God Acts chapter 4, I want to land the plane here, and then I'm going to pray. I know you guys got, (laughs) the power's going to go out here, of course, in 20 minutes. We ain't worried about that, though. If you're stuck on the ground, just stay there. You'll be all right. In Acts chapter 4, you have, first of all, the book of Acts, I would just highly recommend brushing up on. 
It'll help correct all of your weird COVID theologies that you might have believed. Paul, Peter were gangsters. They didn't give a rip about nothing. And they weren't facing like mandates of safety. They were facing death. So the Holy Spirit was poured out on Pentecost. What was the purpose of the Holy Spirit being poured out? So that their worship CDs could be cool and they could have skinny jeans and have conferences. No, no, no. It was unto the bold proclamation of the gospel. Okay? And every time they got in trouble... They gathered together to pray for another installment of boldness. This is the story of the book of Acts. They didn't just need one installment. And that's what I tell people like, what we're going to do this week is another installment. And if South Africa ever needed it, now's the time. We're going to have people from all across the continent and all across the nation showing up. We have 12 people from America that are on their way right now. I think they spent the most these, I think these were the most expensive plane tickets I've ever seen to South Africa. I mean, it's crazy with fuel prices and inflation and everything. And, 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 but they're coming, man. The sacrifice of praise. And they're ready to pour it all out on the nation. Um, but Acts chapter 4 talks about uh, Peter and John. They're before the Sanhedrin. And I just want, like, I just want to, I want you to read this with me. Because this is the appropriate response to government. Peter and John are sitting there. This is in the Bible, by the way. Uh, verse, uh, verse 16 says, what are we going to do with these men? This is what the government says. What are we going to do with these men? Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a notable sign and we cannot deny it. <laughs> But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in his name. Super spreaders. We got to stop this. This was one thing. I wasn't upset that the government did what it did in 2020. I was upset that so many Christians complied. Couple of y'all are with me. As if our allegiance is to our government above the kingdom. Well, I don't know. You, the government really just wants to keep you safe. And I mean, they really just, I mean, they really have your best interests at heart. Give me a break. Y'all need to read some history lessons. <laughs> the government has one thing on their mind. Control, manipulation, they will do whatever they can do to achieve those gains. It hasn't changed since the beginning of time. Well, I don't know. They seem really nice. They're not. <laughs> Verse 18. Then they called them in again and commanded them to not speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes? To listen to you or to him? Dang, Peter just dropped the hammer. <laughs> you be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. So they say, disciples, you need to stop. And Peter goes, yeah, that ain't going to happen. Sorry. And he calls their bluff. Basically says, you're not going to do anything. Then it says, after further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. Verse 23, on their release, Peter and John went into hiding for five years. Oh, no, it doesn't say that. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together. This is Psalm chapter 2 they're quoting. 
Verse 27, indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus. These guys are so gangster. They're just like saying, hey, listen, this government is conspiring against the king of kings. Off with his head. You know, they're like, they're, cra- they're calling their own government out for c- gathering with demonic forces to conspire against King Jesus. They're doing this in the Bible. <laughs> Then they say, they did what your power will and decided beforehand. Now the Lord, consider their threats. Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Boldness always follows the baptism of the Holy Spirit. My prayer this week is not how many we can gather. We've gathered thousands. I don't have a number that we have to gather. I don't care how many we gather. My prayer is that whoever we gather gets filled with boldness to turn this nation upside down. Because this is the hour. This is the hour God is looking for the church to rise up. He's looking for the people of God. I'm, I'm telling you, we've seen it in cities across America. They said, it's too, it's too liberal in New York. It's too hard in San Francisco. It's too violence struck in, in Chicago. There's no hope. Every city we go to, thousands of Christians show up. There is a remnant of God in the earth today that will not be shut up. This is the season we have a choice. Are we going to believe the word of God? This is just Acts 4, man. Keep reading. It gets crazier. And every time they face threats, they face intimidation, they face hardship, they say, God, we need your spirit to make us more bold so we can get in more trouble. Like, I mean, seriously, like in America, if they would have faced that, a pastor would have said, I'm going into sabbatical for three years. I need trauma therapy. (laughs) Peter and John were like, hey, we need more boldness so this can happen again. All right, y'all stand up. I want to pray over you. I'm telling you, man, there is, this is the hour in the nation. I feel this so hard on my spirit. Can I get some glory keys? Where's my brother at? Thank you, man. The journey that we've been on in the last two years, I stand here before you today. I've never seen anything in my life like this. The breakthrough, the open doors, the resources, the miracles. I mean, it's crazy. Even for us to be here right now, it's crazy. Like, the momentum, like, only God can do this. And it's not because we were qualified. It's not because we even knew what we were doing. But it's simply because we lifted our hand and we said, all right, God, we'll trust you. Nations are up for grabs right now. A couple of people are excited about that. I'm telling you, man, nations are up for grabs. Cities are up for grabs. The enemy's discombobulated. God is just looking for a couple Gideons that are ready to rumble. That really believe the word. He's looking for a couple Peter and Johns that are like, okay, let's go. Some of you, I just feel like your version of Christianity is too safe. Break out of the safety, man. All the fun is on the outside. We've bought into this lie that that our, our walk with God is sanitized and safe and calculated. No, it's not. He's taken me here to then bring me back here to bring me up here. Go figure. Who knew I had to ruin my whole worship leading career to get to where I am today? I was telling John, this is a this is a hilarity of God. I'm on this worship label. Everybody loves it when albums go number one and it's their biggest prize and joy in life and awards. And I I never really gave a rip about that. But I had to get off my label, be rejected by so many people in an industry. And then when we started releasing Let Us Worship albums, every single one of them went number one. Across every genre in America. 
with no marketing. Like, I, that wasn't even a dream of mine and God gave it to me. So I'm just saying, like, I, my heart, like, we're coming here. We came this week to South Africa, and I am telling you, I'm holding nothing back. I mean, it is like God brought us here. It's worked out in his divine timing, and it's time to shift this entire nation. And I'm standing, I'm standing on some pretty good testimonies right now. And I'm saying, God, if you did this, and you did this, and you did this, okay, now is the time for every prophetic word to culminate and come to pass. And I need some gritty, fiery South Africans who believe that. Out with the old, in with the new. Out with the, out with the pre-COVID church, in with the post-COVID church. The gates of hell will not prevail. I'm telling you, in America, the enemy messed up. He overplayed his hand. He kicked us out of our big, nice churches with our perfect sound systems that we love so much because they sound amazing. And we said, okay, fine. The church has left the building. It's on now, devil. We're going to downtown Los Angeles. We're going to downtown Seattle. We're going into Antifa's territory. Now, we don't even want to go back to church. We want the whole city. I mean, it's prophetic. We're going to be outside this Saturday. We're going to be outdoors, man. The, the sound of worship is going outdoors, not in a church. We're going outdoors. This thing is going viral. And I believe it's going to be a marking moment to start taking cities back for Jesus. The enemy screwed up. He brought fear and intimidation and discouragement, and now he's about to pay the price. And it's okay, like, it's okay in this season to be a little angsty. Christians need to start rising up with a little fire. We're not going to be pushed around by the enemy anymore. We're not going to be pushed around by the government anymore. We ain't stopping. Well, that's a little rebellious. I don't know. It's not really the spirit. Come on, man. We just don't know what boldness looks like because we've been so timid for so long. This is our DNA. And, and there's going to be more tests that come. I don't know if it's monkey pox or what other poxes are coming, right? This was just a test. And we're here. We're still standing. Let me pray for you. I just feel this, this um, timidity thing. I feel like God wants to obliterate that in any theological, um, any, any, any false theological things we believe that empowered us to be cowards. Any false theological frameworks that we bought into, we heard it a lot across America, if you really love your neighbor, wear a mask and stay at home while your neighbor commits suicide because you didn't do anything to care for them. If you really love da-da-da, then you'll be obedient and da-da-da. I mean, I've never seen Christians so docile in my life. We've been rule breakers from the start. <laughs> I'm telling you, if you really love your nation, you fight for it. If you really love the church, you fight for it. Lord, I thank you today, God, that you are releasing a spirit of boldness on the church of South Africa. Lord, we have been through it and we've come out the other side refined. We've come out the other side, Lord, full of the testimony of how we're still standing and we're still here. Lord, I pray, God, I pray, Lord, that the same boldness and the same encounters that are filling the book of Acts, let that be the church in Johannesburg today. Let us be the people of God. The, let, us, let us be the people that the enemy doesn't want to mess with. He knows when he messes with us, we're going to give it right back to him. I pray, and I, I just feel this in my spirit. Listen, I, 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 this is something from God. I, I really feel this. Um, all of the things that have been stolen from you over the last two years, even simple things like birthday parties, graduation ceremonies, gatherings together, things that have been stolen, I've, it's time to get feisty about those. 
It's time to get back. The thief has to repay sevenfold for what's been stolen. Lives that have been stolen. You know, some of you guys have developed addictions and things that you never had before. It's time to throw those off and it's time to get paid back seven times for what was taken in your life. This is a sevenfold season. We're gonna fight for it and we're gonna contend for it, but we're gonna get it, amen? So Lord, I just pray and I feel like some of y'all are supposed to go home and write down those things that were taken from you in the last two years could have been your peace. It could have been your, your, your uh, you know, whatever stuff in your family. It could be, uh, you know, times that you had in your small group or things that you weren't allowed to do. I don't know what it is, but I feel like there's some holy fire uh, prayers and intercession that's going to come on you to see a sevenfold return of everything that was stolen. So Lord, I pray God, make the church in South Africa wild again. Undomesticate the roar of the lion of Judah in this land. I pray this week, God, would be a week of an open heaven. I pray this week would be a week, God, where worship shatters through the heaviness, shatters through despair, shatters through disappointment. I pray for an obnoxious joy that takes over the church, that makes us the most radical, wild, Jesus-loving people this city's ever seen. And we pray for a harvest of souls like we've never seen in our life. Just put your hand on someone next to you. Come on, just pray for that boldness. I feel like some of you guys are gonna get free. I just feel there's addictions in this room that are gonna be broken this week. Addictions in this room that are gonna be broken. You know they're unhealthy. You know you can't run after Jesus with them. They're gonna fall off you this week as you pursue the Lord together. Come on, just begin to pray. Pray a little bit more for each one on your right and left. All right, and while you're praying, if you've battled suicide or depression, if you've battled suicide or depression, I do this in every city I go to, every city across the world, I do this because God is bringing freedom because there was such isolation and fear. If you battled suicide or depression in the last season, I want you to come down front here. Come on, I got five minutes before the power goes out and the power's about to come on in Jesus' name. Come on, if that's you, if you've battled depression. Come on. This is a no shame zone. We're not going to shame people because we've all battled with stuff. But this is an area that we need to break off of people in this season. Come on. If that's you, come down front. Don't feel embarrassed. Don't feel ashamed. This is how you get free. You want to pray, John? Okay. All right. Come on. Just lift your hands up. Lord, We declare over every son and daughter here, over every life, Satan, you cannot have them. They were bought with a price. We break off all discouragement in Jesus' name. We break off the curse of of, of death over their life. We break off the demonic lies that they've come into agreement with. We thank you, Lord, that their life has value. Lord, that they were bought with a price. God, that you gave your very son that they may have freedom. Lord, today we speak freedom over them. We speak breakthrough over them. Break off the discouragement. Break off the fear, God. Break off the loneliness. I just feel like the Father wants to come and hug you today. He wants to come and embrace you today. And as He embraces you, all of the disappointment's going to fall off of you. Come on, just let it out. Just let it out. Let all that despair out. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness just let off the despair of the last season. No more despair. Lord, we thank you. You did not, you did not, you did not have us live with pills in order to cope, with alcohol in order to cope, with drugs in order to cope. But God, you've given us the joy of the Holy Spirit. Release it over every single one of them today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 
I just feel like the Lord wants you to know how precious you are. Somehow you've forgotten. You bought into the lie of the enemy. And he just wants to remind you how special and precious you are. There's never been anybody created like you. And all of heaven waits for you with expectation to step into the fullness of your calling. And I just speak grace, 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 grace over every person. There's no condemnation. There's no condemnation. There's grace. There's freedom. We cannot have one person in the body that is not active. We cannot afford one person in this church that is not engaged following the call of Jesus. We need everybody in alignment, everybody activated. This is an everybody activated season. There's no one on the sidelines anymore. It's time to get in the game, baby.